Good morning. Let's stand together. We're going to sing hymn number 289. We'll sing both verses of Days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. As you take a minute and greet each other, children, we got children's church today, you can go on back, okay? You greet each other this morning. I'm so glad I'm a part. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. Cleanse my soul. Joy cares for Jesus as the trouble is gone. For I'm part of the several on the prayer that I just need to go over this morning remember we have LaRose Bennett we have Herbert Turnage 
Larry McGee, I mean, I'm sorry, Larry Turnage, I'm sorry, Thomas McKenzie, my brother George Moore, which is a pastor at Oak Grove, Marianne Hosley, uh, Jack and Joe McGee, Trent Thornhill, and we also have the funeral for Mr. Lawrence Bean. You need to remember his family. The wake will be from 5 to 9 at Colonial, with the funeral being Monday at 2. Is, um, is there anyone else that we need to add this morning? And uh, welcome to New Hope Baptist Church. We are thrilled and excited for you to be here to worship our King and our Lord Jesus with us this morning. I have just a few announcements that I'd like to bring before you. Uh, just a reminder about the deacons meeting tonight following worship, uh, evening worship. This is a, there will be a special uh, session basically within the first five minutes of the deacons meeting. So we're asking that all active and inactive deacons be there. The inactive deacons will not need to stay the entire time, but you will. It is in your best interest to be there for at least about the first five minutes to to hear what is said. Um, also, just like to remind everybody that we have a special evening worship tonight as well. We have our children and youth camp report coming on tonight. So, although there will not be a a official message, so to speak, this will be a time of great encouragement for you as our congregation and also as you have seen and as you will hear tonight about what God has done in our youth particularly I don't know I wasn't at the children's camp but I heard there were some great things happen there too we have, we'll have a slideshow tonight and so on and so forth so please make an effort to be here tonight to support our children's ministry and our youth ministry I also like to remind you that this upcoming uh, Wednesday we have at four o'clock services at Myrtle's and Myrtle's nursing home and also a couple of other things that are going on in the life of the church next Sunday at uh, 2 o'clock, we'll have the baby shower for Victoria McNabb in the home of Miss Teresa McKenzie. And also, uh, that evening during worship service, we'll have our report from the Honduras mission trip. Guys, you are not going to want to miss, I mean, in my opinion, you're not going to want to miss any Sundays, morning or evening, okay? That's just where I stand. But especially tonight, and especially next Sunday night, you're not going to want to miss uh, the two reports brought to us from our youth and children tonight and also our missionaries who went to Honduras next week. Also, just like to remind you as well that uh, about a week and a half from now, Thursday, July 21st, the youth and upcoming youth will leave the church at 845 to go to Camp Shelby for a quick little tour. It's just a day trip. We're going to have some lunch, so they'll need money for lunch, and then we'll come on back to the church. Um, this is just a just another great opportunity for us to go and see Camp Shelby and for our youth group to kind of grow together. So they'll need about ten dollars for lunch. We'll probably stop and eat at uh, at Christian Filet, our our Chick Fil A, is that what they call it? And uh, we'll also uh, it's just going to be a great time of fellowship. So we'll be going there on July twenty first. Also, there is a mission opportunity for each one of us, 
and that is a, a disaster relief in Brazoria, Texas, July 17th through 22nd. A, the training meals and floor to seat and the floor to sleep on will be provided. And so if you're not trained or if you're worried about sleep, you will get both and you're even going to get a nice comfortable floor to sleep on. Um, it is going to be hot out there, so I just would like to recommend that you stay hydrated. And if you want to go, I would actually begin hydrating now just to prep your body for it, okay? And uh, you can contact David Heaton right there. His phone number is in the bulletin, or you can contact Mr. Pudstringer for more details. All right, we had a, uh, oh, we're also doing a smoked chicken plate benefit for Miss Courtney Rowell. That will take place on July 15th, 2000, you know the year, 2016. Uh, it's going to go from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., and tickets are $8 each. Uh, you can call Jesse right there. There's a special little paper. The number for contact is right there in your bulletin. And uh, if you order five plates more, they will deliver. If you order four plates or less, you'll have to pick it up yourself. All right, we had 168 in Sunday school today with 12 uh, people logging into the phone ministry and also 12 visitors. Now, I would just like to offer a, uh, a word of prayer this morning before I, before I step down. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. God, we recognize that you are indeed Lord, that you are indeed King, that you are Savior, that you are the very definition of the word love. So God, in this place today, I pray that we would reflect your love. God, that our hearts and our minds would be focused upon you and you alone. Lord, to set aside all distractions in our lives. Lord, help us to be honest, help us to be real, help us to be genuine. God, help us to serve you in all that we do. We just pray for our children's church, Father, that you would do a great work over there in the hearts and minds of those children. And God, we pray the same for here, that we would be attentive to your word. God, that we would look to the cross. And God, that we would be fully reliant upon you. We thank you so much for that grace and that mercy that we did not deserve, but you have given to us instead the free gift of life that you have given to us in Jesus. And Lord, we are thankful that he took the punishment for us so that we may know you deeply and intimately. Thank you so much for your word, Father, and how you use it to mold us and to fold us into your image. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who enables us to glorify and to honor you with all that we say and do. God, I pray that you would be pleased when you look upon this service this morning. Lord, that you would find people whose hearts belong to you, Lord, whose people who are dedicated to following and to serving you. Lord, we thank you for this place to worship you this morning. I just pray that you will, that you will do a great and mighty work here today. It's in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, that I pray these things. Amen. 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 As we continue in worship, wait, we got to do birthdays. Who's got a birthday this week? Nobody? Tanner? Go ahead and stand up, Tanner. <laughs> Miss Tammy? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Who? Sarah? Go ahead and stand up. Forgive me with names in the back. Mr. Ben. Who else? Let's sing to these this morning. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. You have a happy birthday this week. As we continue in worship, hymn number 502, 601, and 532, you can remain seated.
second verse. I'm hearing some pretty harmonies. I want to do the second verse all a cappella, okay? And the chorus. And y'all come in on the third, okay? Just give me a chord. Here we go. When the shadows. When the shadows of this life are torn up, fly away, fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has fallen, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Just a sing 486. We'll sing all three. This will be our offertory. Let's sing.
you, ladies. Mr. Jason and Miss Renee Stringer are going to come lead us. so weary when troubles come and my heart burdened be then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me you me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. There is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you come and I am filled with wonder, sometimes stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy sea. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I Raise me up so I can stand. 
your hearts to me in prayer this morning. Father, I come before you with no strength of my own. I come before you, God, and I feel like I'm just about emptied out. So God, during this time, during this message, Lord, I pray for your strength. God, I pray for your grace, for your mercy. I am a servant, Lord, a broken vessel. And I pray that you would use this vessel at least one more time. Help me to give it all I've got so that your word would be proclaimed, so that your name would be glorified, so that the people here would know the name that is above every name, will know how they are called to respond to times of troubles and trials and to know what their marching orders are. Lord, we are, or rather we should be, we should be in mourning over the things that have happened in our country over the past week. Innocent lives taken by the hands of evil. Lord, families hurt and destroyed and those problems only magnified a hundred times over by the invention of the thing called social media. The whole world looks upon these families and they either stand in opposition to them or they stand with them. And Lord, it just seems, it just seems as if things are getting worse. Lord, I pray that you would help me speak to the issue today. Lord, that you would break down the barriers that that are in over our hearts regarding certain things. Lord, I don't want them to hear my opinion because even my opinion is wrong. I want them to hear yours. I want them to know where you stand, Father. I pray these things in the name that I'm dependent upon for my salvation, in the name that I'm dependent upon my strength, and even the very words that I speak. Jesus, give me words. It's by Jesus' name that I pray these things. Amen. Amen. This morning, if you know anything about me, you will have known that I have a very uh, unique fascination with all things military, particularly Roman military. I love just reading about the battles and the, the strategies and so on and so forth. And Today I would like to talk to you about a little bit of a, a strategy that the Romans would have and also several people throughout the mid medieval ages would have when it comes to warfare, when it comes to the battlefield. They would line their soldiers up in what we would, pretty much what we would call platoons or, or companies. And they would stand them side by side and most of the time they would stand them in a line, shoulder to shoulder next to each other. And they would have men armed standing in the back and we would call those the reinforcements and when the enemy would attack and fall upon these lines at one point or another the line would begin to break and you would hear the commander say and only a voice the commander could give fill the gap bridge the gap where the soldiers were falling, the reinforcements would be called in to sustain the gap, to bring hope, to bring strength back to the front lines. I believe we're at a time in our country where we need to fill the gap. I believe we're at a time in our country where, it is, where we are seeing the stress poured upon the foundations of our very government and it is time for us to fill the gap. And when I say us, I do not, I'm not talking about a, a political solution. I'm not talking about a presidential solution. I'm not talking about an economic solution. I'm not even talking about an emotional solution. I'm talking about a spiritual solution brought by spiritual people. And I'm talking about us Christians. 
I'm not speaking to the Buddhists. I'm not speaking to Muslims. I'm not speaking to atheists. I'm speaking to Christians. And we, throughout the centuries, throughout our history, have been people who stood the gap. When the Roman government was persecuting those who were poor and oppressed, and a large majority of those Christians, we stood the gap. In the medieval century before Martin Luther, well, at the time of Martin Luther, when he began the Reformation, Martin Luther and his brothers and people who stood to his ideologies of the Bible instead of against what was, a, what was once a corrupt Catholic church, they stood the gap. And even 50 years ago, with Martin Luther King Jr., we saw that him being the pastor and the Christian he was, calling upon his fellow brothers in Christ to stand the gap. And I believe today we are at a pivotal point in our nation where we too as Christians must stand the gap. We'll be taking a look at a piece of scripture today, Romans chapter 12, the entire chapter. And I'll be looking, I'll be going through it uh, briefly, verse by verse. But this is a very practical solution to the problem, I believe. See, the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans. He wrote to the Roman church. He had never met this, this church before. And so he kind of provided a, a overview of his theology, so to speak. This is the most comprehensive theology we have of the Apostle Paul. And so he spends the first half of this book laying out the theological guidelines laying out who Christ is, laying out what sin does to us, laying out everything we need to know on a theological level, and then he comes in in the later half of this book and says, here is how we apply our faith. Given the timeline of this book was written, it was most likely written before the Christians in Rome underwent an intense persecution, either at the hands of Nero and then later on, about 20, 30 years ago, at the hands of uh, Domitian, if I remember correctly. Where Christians were slaughtered, hung, imprisoned, starved, marginalized, beaten for their faith in this man called Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, in the 12th chapter, gives us a very practical answer to filling the gap. So here it is, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We're going all the way through to verse 21, I believe. Yeah, verse 21. He writes this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Verse 3. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophesy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Verse 9, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. 
Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Could you imagine reading those words during persecution? Where your brothers and sisters are being slaughtered and you read those words right there. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Continuing on, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't miss this. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20, To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. And finally, in the last verse, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When I read this passage, I think of Jesus' words, If you wish to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And have you ever thought about that phrase, deny yourself? Used to, uh, and I still do, but a little bit deeper now, I used to think that, was, that meant deny my, my sin, deny my selfish ambitions, deny my pride, deny my anger. And it does mean that, don't get me wrong. But I think it means a little bit deeper than what I previously thought it meant to be. I think it also means to deny my ideologies that are wrong, deny my thought patterns that are against the Word of God, that are not in clear teaching of Scripture. Now, when you start talking about that, that gets a little harder, I think. Because that requires some, some digging deep down. That requires us to identify who we are at the core of our individual and then to, to root out. See, if you've ever done any studying in uh, family parenting or anything along those lines, you know that a child's foundation is basically, or a person's foundation is built when they are a child. The things that are placed within that child at an early age are oftentimes what they stick with the rest of their lives. And we see, we see a testimony to that last week at camp as we, as several of our group members, had the, the pleasure of ministering to kids in low-income areas who didn't know their, their parents and didn't know who half their brothers and sisters were and who never even heard a lick of the gospel. And, and we, we saw that firsthand. A lot of my group did. Now you think what those kids are raised in. Those kids are raised in the, the old adage, survival of the fittest. They, surely they lived with their brothers and sisters. They didn't care to know who they were because they might not, if they eat, I might not eat. And if I eat, they might not survive. They might not grow to an old age where they walk as adults. They also grew up in the fact that whatever their parents or whatever their guardians were teaching them. What if they were being taught to hate? What if they were being taught to hate people of another color, of another religion? Many of those kids were Muslims or being raised in a Muslim family. What if they were being taught to hate someone who wore the uniform? What if they were being taught to hate the man who stood behind the pulpit, the one, the people who represent the cross? And so within them, they're, they're, there's a foundation placed within them that we automatically see being Christians as wrong, right? I mean, I don't think anybody would disagree with me there. What they're brought up in is wrong. But I'm not here to, to preach to them. I'm here to preach to you. 
And I'm here to preach to myself. Do not forget that either. What about the things I was raised up in that were wrong? What about the things you were raised up in that you taught, that you were taught that was wrong? See, a lot of those kids becoming adults don't recognize the wrong because in their eyes that is what is right. What if the same illusion that fogs their eyes fogs ours in some areas? Now, of course, we have the Holy Spirit, and He leads us and guides us, and He enables us to glorify God, and He convicts us of sin and draws us closer to Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. But I also feel like the Holy Spirit also draws some of those foundations we had as children and convicts us of them to change us. What if we were to take the stance of Christ as he walked the earth? You know, Christ did not have a problem hanging out with the sinners. Christ did not have a problem being around the people who needed him the most. Christ did not have a problem explaining to, to sinful humanity, which is all of us, that they are to repent and believe in the gospel, repent of their sins and believe in him. But how many times, even myself, do I look at someone and I snap judgment of them based upon what they look like? How many times do I, when I walk down the aisle at Walmart, and even though there's small aisles, guys, I know I've been to Walmart, Columbia. Do I move to the other side or skip the aisle altogether, although there's an item I need on it? How many times do I look upon social media and see the hate and see the evil that is outpouring from the mouths of men and women alike who are on both sides of the line and I choose to remain silent instead of speaking up? See, I'm preaching to you and to myself and probably more to myself than any of you. A lot of you are a lot older and you've got it figured out. Me, I'm still trying to figure it out. But I know, I know a couple of things. I know that to change the world, it has to start with us. It has to change with what is wrong within us. I mean, Jesus said it. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. It's Matthew chapter 5, I believe, or Matthew chapter 6, one of those two. Maybe Matthew 7 is Sermon on the Mount. I know that much. Y'all are like, does that even know the Bible? Oh. Here it is, Matthew chapter 7. Verse 3, why do you see that speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the, the, when there is the log in your own eye? Notice this, he says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Something I think we sometimes miss when we're reading that verse is we read, okay, well, Jesus doesn't want me to be a hypocrite. He wants me to, you know, clean up my own eyes so I'm not looking at other people's eyes. But the very last part of that, he says, clean up your eye so that you can help somebody else with their eye. So it all starts with us. It all starts with our foundations, identifying the things that are wrong within us, removing those things, and then moving forward and say, hey, I know where you come from. I was in that. Let me help you get out of it. I wish I could offer a practical solution. And I can. I can tell you that it revolves around the gospel and people giving their lives to Christ for there to be peace within this country again. But 
in a practical way, how do we go about that? Well, I do, I do have some tips, I guess. But for what I want us to understand is I want us to understand that, you know, sometimes, and, and myself included, again, I'm right here with you, okay? Now, sometimes we, we sit on Facebook or we sit in front of the TV and we watch the news and we cross our arms and we say, well, that's real low. We would never do stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not that bad of a person. I am, I'm not out shooting innocent people. I'm not taking out police officers. I'm not killing orphans and killing babies and this, that, and the other. And we just kind of say, well, since I'm not doing those things, I can, I can sit here and I can sit in righteousness. I don't have to worry about those things, especially if they're not in our face, right? I mean, it's one thing to watch something on TV and it be in Dallas or it be in Baton Rouge or it be in... Uh, Jackson, or so on and so forth. But what if those things began happening in Foxworth? What if those things began happening right here in our own plate? What would we do? And I'll say this, we need to do for Dallas, for Baton Rouge, the exact same thing we would do here for Foxworth. We need to live, guys, as though this is in our hometowns and in our communities. And what I mean by that is once we identify those issues that are, that are in the way and we recognize that all life is precious, every single life is precious, and we need to start looking at people as Christ looks at them. Now, if you have a hard time looking at people how Jesus looks at them, I suggest you pray. You ask the Lord, say, Lord, help me to see people the way you see them. Help me to love people the way you love them. Help me to speak truth into their life as though you were physically here speaking truth into their lives today. Help me to be your representative. Help me to be your ambassador. I believe that we need to begin reaching out. And all that for us, since it's not in Foxworth, it's not in Columbia, is going to be our words on Facebook, on Twitter, how we react to those things. It's real easy to take one side and stick with that side. But what about being the peacemaker in it? What about standing up for the value of each and every single human life, even those who we who have committed crimes against our police, uh, our police force and our government? What if instead of looking at this presidential election as bad choice and bad choice, bad choice number one and bad choice number two, but instead we look at this as two people who are in need of the gospel, who need Jesus to invade their life and to bring them to repentance? What if instead of we don't look at it as Muslim terrorism, our police brutality or whatever, wherever you stand, but instead we look at each and every single individual as someone who needs the love of Jesus in their life. I've seen people with the very worst foundation set within them. I'm talking hate. I'm talking anger. I'm talking racism. I'm, ta I'm talking the whole nine yards. And when Jesus invaded their life, he changed them from the inside out. And that is what he's capable of doing. How about we be the people that bring that message to those people? I've said it before, and you've heard me say it, but we are the beggars who have found the bread of life. So let us bring it to the other beggars. Because each of us are a beggar. Each of us are in need of that love and that life that Jesus offers. And we have found it. We have found the bread. We have found the life. We have found Christ. Let us bring it to others. Going back to Romans chapter 12, I'd just like to make a few, few quick comments, particularly starting in verse 9 and kind of going down through there. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil. Be real and be genuine towards these people. You know, sometimes I think that we can we can give the, the right answer. We know the right answer. But that's only the right answer because it's here and not here. It's in our head, but it's not in our heart. 
when we give them the answer, let it be from our heart. Let it be because we are fighting for their soul, for their eternity. Let love be genuine. Hold fast to what is good. Verse 12 also, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. I'll say this for the future as much as I do for right now. I believe that we are on a fast track to seeing Christianity further marginalized in our society. Now, will it ever come to persecution? I don't rightly know. But we know the formula for undergoing persecution. Rejoice in hope. We rejoice in the hope that Christ is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. We rejoice in the hope that our sins have been forgiven through the cross of Christ and that he did not stay dead, but he is alive and well with the Father in heaven and that one day we will be with him too. We be patient in tribulation. Have you ever undergone a little bit of trouble, a little bit of trials, and you just flew off the wall? Okay? If you're like me, you've done it. All right? And all of a sudden, you know, you're standing out in the backyard with a 9 miller, millimeter taking care, of, uh, taking care of old memorabilia, okay? Maybe I shouldn't say that, but... Be patient in tribulation. How we react to those trials and those troubles says a lot about us. How we react... In times of fierce persecution, says a lot about who we are as an individual, who what our character is like. Be constant in prayer. I fully believe that to have the first two, you must have the third. You must be in a state of prayer, talking and walking with the Father and with Jesus throughout the day. When we come to Him in the morning. And we lay out our needs before Him and we praise Him. We thank Him for who He is. We thank Him for His Word. When we, when we, every time we bow our head and thank Him for the food, because that's something we do. That's something we do here in the South. We thank God for the food. Every time we bow that head and we thank Him for the food, we, we give it to Him. We lay our requests before Him. We praise Him. We thank Him. When we lay in bed at night and throughout the day, whenever He he pricks our hearts and, and encourages in us in the spirit to pray we should bow our head and pray A.W. Tozer is the guy who basically said this he said your physical stance when you pray matters that's a summary your physical stance when you pray matters so if you're able I'd encourage you when you pray to kneel even a step farther to lay face down on the ground and pray but rejoice in hope be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer and do do not be overcome verse 21 do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good you know it's real easy to get into the mind frame of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Man, if he shot my dog, I should shoot his. Man, he stole my wallet. I need to take his. And he came in my house, shot my windows up. I need to shoot his. And right there with you once again. But you know how much it speaks to our character when we react to evil with good? I'm reminded of a of a little old lady in the uh, the Walmart parking lot. And sure enough, you know, every time I start a story like this, I don't do the research. So it could very well have been one of these little ladies I'm about to talk about could be right here in this church just because, you know what I'm saying? Had a youth pastor one time who was talking to a girl at the seminary, and he started talking to her about, did you hear about that girl who got robbed? At her, she got carjacked right here on seminary campus. She was held at gunpoint, this, that, and the other. And this girl looks at him and is like, yeah, that was me. He was like, oh. So this could very well be the case. But I remember a few years back reading about a little, little lady who, who the, she got into her car at Walmart, the doors were unlocked, and this dude hopped in the passenger seat with her, and he had a pistol in his hand. He was like, give me your money. You know, like, Straight up, robber, going to steal, threaten to kill her. You know what that little old lady did? Some of you are like, did she pull out a 38? No, she didn't. Just spoiler alert. 
she shared the love of Jesus with that guy. And after she shared the love of Christ with him and he, he repented of his sins, you know what she did? She went a step farther. She gave him the money out of her wallet anyway because he needed it. How many of us, including myself, if someone were to come to my front door hungry and in need of a place to sleep, would I open up that door to him and say, come on in, I've got some food. We might be eating pizza rolls, but we got food. How many of us, when you're at Walmart and you're going by that front door and you got some guy out there saying, hey, can I get some money? Or better yet, real life example, what about right here in Tollertown at the Sonic? I know if you've been there late at night, you've seen that guy. He comes up to your window and he asks you for money for food. I've seen two reactions. No joke, I've seen two. I've seen the reaction where, ah, we ain't giving you anything, go on, move on. And I've seen the reaction where the person gave him some change and shared the gospel with that guy. And I'll say this about the guy in Tylertown, that guy knows Jesus. What will we do, though, in those situations? What about when someone slanders us on Facebook? What about if someone calls up my mama and starts talking bad about me to her? Or what if someone calls you up and starts talking bad about your child? What are you going to say? What are you going to do? Guys, I guess what I'm getting at here is what are the marks of your character? What are the marks of mine? Are we going to be people who rejoice in our hope in Christ? Who be patient when trials and troubles come our way? Who will be constant in bringing our prayers to the Father? Or will we be a people who reacts as the rest of the world reacts? Who will seek to repay evil for evil? Who will seek to bring that eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Or will we be people of grace and of mercy? I like to, for this time, have a moment of silence. Because right now, to a lot of us, the people who were killed in Dallas this past week, they're just, their faces, we might not even remember their names. I've got their names right here, including the name of the shooter. I like for us to pray for those families. I like for us to, to mourn and to grieve with them, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I'm wearing black today. That was not an accident. And even though I couldn't find a tie to match it, I am wearing black. Because I do believe we need to mourn with those families who are in Dallas right now both the policemen's families who gave their lives in the line of duty and also for that man's families who began shooting at those cops to begin with. I believe we need to pray for both their families. Here are the names. Brent Thompson, Patrick Zemaripa, Michael Kroll, Lauren Ahrens, Michael Smith, those were the police officers who were slain, and Micah Xavier Johnson, he was the name, that was the name of the shooter who killed those police officers. I like for this time just to be a moment where we can bow our heads together and we can pray in silence for these families because they are hurting. And they need to know the love of Christ more so in this time than ever before. So please bow your head with me if you will. And I'll pray for us in just a moment.
just come to you. And we recognize that there were six names, six people that you love and that you cared for who have entered into eternity. And Lord, my hope and my prayer is that they, that they knew you. Lord, I pray for the families of Brent Thompson, Patrick Zemaripa, Michael Kroll, Lauren Ahrens, Michael Smith, and Micah Xavier Johnson. God, I lift them up to you now. Lord, I pray that your spirit would heal them. Police officers, he was a newlywed. Just married. God, I pray for the others who were, who were fathers. Lord, I know of two of them that had younger children. One just got back from vacation. I pray that you would draw those families and those children to you during this time, Lord. That, would you, that you would grant them peace. That you would grant them comfort. God, that you would help them to mourn during this time. Lord, that they would, that they would see how you are at work in the midst of this to draw them to you. Because we know that you do draw near to those who are brokenhearted. Father, for another one of the police officers who is a dedicated professional, every man on the, in the department loved working with him because he was so happy-go-lucky and cheerful. He was a professional, Lord. Lord, I pray for his family. I pray for that department. God, as they mourn the loss of fellow policemen, as they mourn the loss of husbands, fathers, sons. God, I pray for your mercy and your grace to fall upon them, for your love to overcome the grief that is in their lives now, that their souls will be mended, their hearts, their hearts repaired. And Father, for the shooter, Lord, I don't know what sort of evil grabbed his mind to commit this evil deed. But I pray, Father, that no, no more evil would fall upon this city. God, that you would guide and guard the minds of the people. That you would help them to see that you have placed the police there to protect them and to serve them, to love them. Lord, that there would be peace in this family's life as they mourn and as they try to understand why their son would do this, or why their brother would do this, or why their, their father would do this, God, I pray that you would be with that family, and that even though, even though he is the one that committed the deed, I pray that his family find repentance in you. Lord, they would repent of their sins, they would give their lives to Jesus, and they would follow him as Lord and Savior. I pray, God, that they would give back to their community. I pray, Lord, that they would give back to the police department. I pray, God, that love would prevail in this, in this time. God, that it would overcome the evil that has taken place. God, I pray for the churches that are there in, the, in Dallas. God, I pray that each and every single one of those Christians rallies around these families and loves on them and, and, and shares the gospel with them and provides for their needs during this time. Lord, I pray for your leadership, your leadership to fall upon the, the governing authorities there, the governor, the mayor of, of uh, the, the governor of Texas and the mayor of Dallas and all the, the city uh, council and whoever else is in authority there, God, I pray that they would follow your leadership and to do what is right according to your plan and your grace and your mercy. Lord, I pray, I pray that a revival that a renewal of your spirit would spark out of this. God, I pray that your people would be a praying one. I pray, God, that when trials come our way, we would be patient in the tribulation. God, I pray that uh, we would rejoice in our hope that is found in Christ, and we do have a great reason to rejoice. God, I pray for this country. I pray for its leaders that they would seek you, God, that they would find you at the cross. Lord, they would repent of their sins and turn to you. Lord, I pray for our school boards. Lord, that their leadership would not be hostile to the gospel being in their school systems. 
And Lord, for those who are students in the school systems who are Christians, God, I pray that they would share the gospel. Lord, I pray that same thing for each of us. As we go to Walmart, as we go to Winn-Dixie, as we go about our business, Lord, help us to be open and aware of the opportunities that you present us to share the gospel. Because this is a lost and dying world, and we have the bread of life. We have the water that will quench our thirst permanently. God, may we share it with those who are around us. May you give us a heart for people who even though they don't even look like us or they don't have the same ideologies as us or they, they just we have nothing in common with them, God, I do pray that you would just give us a heart for them to reach out and to love them just as your son loves them. Help us to see them because they are created in your image. You have said so, Father. You knew them before they were even in their mother's womb. So God, help us to love them. Help us to walk in fellowship with one another. Help us to encourage one another. I pray, Father, that you would give us strength. And it is the name that is above every name that I pray these things. Amen. Amen. During this time, we will have a moment, maybe even a couple of moments, for you to respond. The altars will be open, of course. If you feel the need to come and pray, you can pray right there at your pew. If you would like to give your life to Christ today and follow Him as Lord and Savior, I would love to meet down here up front with you to talk with you about it. And uh, if you have any questions regarding the sermon, well, you can find me in the parking lot afterwards. We'll stand together.